Good evening. Let's do it again. Good evening. Thank you. To briefly introduce Dr. Oliver Sachs, who really needs no introduction, I want to quote from a review of his latest book, Hallucinations. This came from the Washington Post. This doctor cares deeply about his patients' experiences, about their lives, not just about their diseases. Through his accounts, we can imagine what it's like to find that our perceptions don't hook onto reality that our brains are constructing a world that nobody else can see, hear, or touch. And with that, I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Oliver Sachs. Uh, excuse me, I can't stand bright lights. <laughs> That's great. Dr. Zach celebrated his 80th birthday just recently. And he told me this morning that he feels that this 80th year and this eighth decade is going to be freeing to allow him to do things he's never done before. I told him that my mother-in-law lived until she was 92, and she said that the 80s were the best years <laughs> of her life. So I think that Dr. Oliver Sacks is right on. And with that, uh, Dr. Sachs, how good to see you again. That's a little awkward for you. Would you like to take no, no. a sip and then I'll put it down on the chair on the table for you? Um, I'll try it here. And if, I'm if I worried know, well, it's it, curved. It, it'll be a little drama. Okay, um, here. Oh no, perhaps I better Let me it. take Sorry. it. Okay. Let me take it and I'll give it back to you when you tell me you'd like another sip. How's that? <laughs> okay. I'd like to turn really immediately to the subject that affects in one way or another, either directly or indirectly, the issue that affects so many of us, and that is a chapter in your book titled The Illusions of Parkinsonism. First, uh, can you explain to us the differences between Parkinson's disease and Parkinsonism. Um, uh, uh, James Parkinson, whose name is used, uh, described people whom he saw in the streets of London at the beginning of the 19th century who shook and who were bent forward and who sometimes moved into rapid, uh, uncontrollable running and uh, so we speak of Parkinson's disease um, for a, an illness like this which comes on without any obvious antecedents. But there are many other possible causes of Parkinsonism. My awakenings patients had all had a strange illness, the epidemic sleepy sickness or encephalitis lethargica and they had post-encephalitic Parkinsonism. Um, manganese minors make it manganese Parkinsonism. So Parkinsonism is, is a general word. It doesn't tell one the origin of the disease. And yet does it, uh, does Parkinsonism, even though it sounds slightly more benign 
than Parkinson's disease, does it exhibit the same kinds of um, symptoms that Parkinson's does? Um, yes, exactly the same kind, sometimes more severely. Really? I've, I've never seen patients with Parkinson's disease as, as sunk uh, in immobility as, as my awakenings patients. As your awakenings um, patients? Well, when I went to a hospital in New York in the mid-60s, when I went through the door, I was saw dozens of figures who were absolutely motionless <laughs> at a standstill. And I learned that they had been this way for decades, and these were people with post-encephalitic Parkinsonism. And um, at that time, there was no medication which could help them. And then, of course, everything changed. Everything changed. Can you describe um, the hallucinations about which you've written in your latest book. I know that none can be thought of as typical, but I think they're fascinating as they relate to people who have no disease whatsoever, but who may experience hallucinations. Um, well, uh, hallucinations are completely different from Dreams are completely different from imagery. You're responsible for what you imagine, whereas um, uh, one of one's feelings, when, if one has a hallucination, is who ordered that? Where does it come from? Uh, and um, you are suddenly presented with a reality, visual, auditory, whatever, which um, may have nothing to do with what you're thinking or feeling. And... Um, and after a while, you may be forced to realize that part of your brain is, is behaving independently and imposing these things on you, or at least presenting them to you. Whether you react to the hallucination or not is up to you. Now, when one looks at the brain of an individual who has Parkinson's disease or when one looks at the brain of someone who is experiencing hallucinations, what would the differences be? Um, well, when people are experiencing hallucinations, a particular part of the brain has become overactive. Uh, hallucinations are so vivid and so real uh, and so deceiving because they hijack the um, perceptual apparatus of the brain, for example, the visual parts of the brain. Uh, and this can be highly specific. For example, a, a particular part of the brain is involved in the recognition and perception of faces. And at which you have great difficulty. Um, at which I have great difficulty. Um, although um, I have to observe other things or else have someone to forgive me my blunders. <laughs> um, but um, if, um, if a particular part of, if that part of the brain becomes hyperactive, people will hallucinate faces. And uh, so, so hallucinations are sensory activity without an external object. Sensory activity which, is, which has become independent and autonomous. I, um talked with you a bit this morning about this question of whether Parkinson's, dementia, Alzheimer's, other forms of uh, brain recognition, cognition, may have some similar beginnings may have some similar manifestations that begin in the brain and whether there is research beginning looking at the entire um, uh, creation 
of what we call dementia. Parkinson's dementia, Alzheimer's dementia, dementia, where did they begin? Um, well, uh, 20 years ago the answer would have been no, but now there's considerable debate and considerable research focused on the notion of prions, so-called. Uh, Stanley Prusner um, uh, believed that certain a strange disease called Kuru, and one called Kritzfeld-Jakob disease, these are, uh, uh, could be conveyed by tissues containing prions, and prions are not alive. They're not like bacteria. They are proteins, but they are proteins which can be infectious and pro proteins which can propagate by themselves in the brain and proteins which are misshapen but can impose their misshapen uh, form um, on other proteins in the brain. And uh, a lot of research is going on under Prusner and others which suggests that um, a whole lot of, as you say, a, a, a spectrum of seemingly different diseases, whether it's Parkinson's or Alzheimer's or kurtzfeld jakob or frontotemporal dementia, um, may all finally um, uh, cause the, this self-propagating business with prions. And, uh, and by the same token, one may be able to detect abnormal prion activity in the brain um, 20 years before a person has clinical symptoms. So there are hints now that it might be possible uh, not so much to cure as to prevent all of these dementias which are, are haunting us now. And if one wanted to know one would perhaps 10 years hence have some sort of blood test taken, some sort of imagery mm. of the brain simultaneously that would indicate something yeah. amiss. Uh, well, there are forms of, of PET scanning now, so-called, which, which seem to be the most sensitive, but perhaps something else will be found. Um, uh, whether one wants to know mm -hmm. that in 20 years one will have Alzheimer's or Huntington's is, is another matter. Um, but one would want to know if knowing beforehand opens a way of preventing it. What do you see on the horizon as the most promising um, uh, dimension of prevention as far as Parkinson's or Alzheimer's are concerned? Um, uh, there is considerable thought that if, one, if one's mind is active and the more one exercises one's mind, uh, the less likely one is to get Alzheimer's. This is not absolutely solid, but it's, um, it's uh, one will do no harm by making a point of exercise in one's mind. So I should continue as a radio host. Absolutely. <laughs> you write in your book, Hallucinations, about individuals who've been on L-DOPA or Spenimet for a number of years to treat Parkinson's disease. Are these patients, in your view, experiencing hallucinations because of the L-DOPA? And is there any indication that reduction in small amounts of L-DOPA might normalize that hallucinatory uh, behavior? Um, well, um, people don't always um, disclose 
or acknowledge their own hallucinations. And probably before 1990 or so, it, it wasn't widely realized that so many people with Parkinson's on medication are getting hallucinations. Um, it's a subject which has, has to be approached very tactfully, very, very delicately. Um, the uh, um, L-DOPA doesn't seem to be a hallucinogen uh, like LSD, and there are other conditions for which one is given L-DOPA in which people don't get hallucinations. So there may be a particular sensitivity in Parkinson's, but one, one may be able to titrate the dose, to find a dose which is sufficiently therapeutic, therapeutic but not produce hallucinations. Or again, um, and this depends on the person, uh, you, may, you may have to live with a level of hallucinations, which is not necessarily a bad thing. <laughs> and speaking um, of that, uh, Dr. Sachs, in the 60s, you, perhaps like a few other people in this room, <laughs> experimented with various hallucinogenic <laughs> drugs. Um, and I'm, I'm just wondering about uh, one event where your colleagues uh, who were in the room with you, this was out in California, urged you to take 20 pills of what was it? Um, well, it's a medication called Artane. Artane. Um, it's a sort of belladonna medication that was originally used in treatment of Parkinson's, and it's a deluriant. And um, people said on the beach, you've got to try it. You've got to try it. They said, um, just take 20 tablets, <laughs> and you'll still be in partial control. Um, can I get some water from of you? Of course. <laughs> um, Tell your um, story. One, one oh. gets a very dry mouth oh. with Artane. Yes. And, um, <laughs> and the very thought made me want some water. Okay. Um, well, I got a dry mouth, but I didn't notice any other effects at first. And I was rather disappointed. I thought, um, you know, I hoped I might have wonderful colors, find paradise all around me. Um, I did hear a car stop outside, and um, a couple of old friends, uh, my friend Jim and his wife, would often come in on a Sunday morning. So I, um, I heard them on the path. I said, come in, doors open, and how do you like your breakfast? And how, how shall I do the eggs? And I was preparing their breakfast, and we were chatting. There were little swing doors between the kitchen and the main room. We were chatting. And then I came out with a tray with the breakfast, and there was no one there. Um, and um, I, I almost dropped the, the tray. I was staggered. It, it hadn't occurred to me for a moment th that this was a hallucination. And anyone there would have heard my voice, but no one else's. And um, so I, um, I ate the ham and eggs and... <laughs> All three. Uh, and, and all three all ham and three. eggs. Yeah. And that was actually the, the beginning of some very strange episodes. Um, not, not threatening, but um, uh, I mean, in, in a way, curiously humdrum, ham and eggs. Um, although one of them at the end was not so humdrum because um, I found myself having a conversation with a spider. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't have started it, but you see, the spider said, <laughs> said hello, <laughs> and I had to say hello yourself. <laughs> um, it was a very philosophical spider. <laughs> it had a voice like Bertrand Russell, and it talked like Bertrand Russell. And when I mentioned this years later to an entomologist friend of mine, he said, he said, yes, I know the species. <laughs> No one in this room hearing you speak would recognize the extent to which you experience shyness. 
personally. And I'm wondering what it is that sets you free. Um, well, you people and you are uh. setting me free. No, my, my mother was uh, very shy and was often reduced to silence, but often, but when she was teaching, she became a ham. <laughs> As um, uh, I heard this from uh, my, with my first book, I, uh, I took it to a publisher who had published one of my mother's books, and I said, nice to meet you to the editor. And she said, no, we've met before. And I said, I, I don't remember it. And she said, I was one of your mother's students, and um, it was an obstetrics course, and at one point your mother said, um, we're talking about, she was talking about breastfeeding, your mother said, there's no need to be shy or self-conscious about breastfeeding, and she bent down, retrieved a baby which had been hidden under the desk and breastfed it in front of the class, and you were the baby. How wonderful. Um, uh, How so, um, so, so there's this <laughs> bit of the split personality or whatever. On your part as well. And, uh, and hers, Indeed. yes. I want you to end this conversation by explaining to us whether you believe that individuals taking L-DOPA for Parkinson's disorder might, if the dosage is not exactly correct, might be thought of as psychotic. Oh, I indeed, that, that can happen, and it does happen. And uh, it's very important to know that, um, that there can be um, hallucinations and transient mental changes with, with L-DOPA. And um, I think psychosis is, is maybe too strong a word. But, uh, and if I can lower the medication a bit, it will, it will go away. I think that, um, uh, that most so-called side effects are, are controllable. And, um, and now there are some other wonderful approaches, including surgical approaches to, to Parkinson's. Do you believe in those surgical approaches? Um, well, I've only had two patients, um, one with Parkinson's and one with Tourette's syndrome. The, uh, the young man with Tourette's syndrome did very well indeed, and, and his... Uh, uh, he had really was intract medically intractable and, and no medication could calm him down, but he's done beautifully with deep brain stimulation. And the Parkinsonian patient who would be thrown helplessly from hyperactive states to frozen ones, so-called on-off reactions, she is now much, much more modulated after deep brain stimulation. Um, you know, when I first came to the States in 1960, I worked in a hospital in San Francisco, and there there was a neurosurgeon, Bertram Feinstein, the, the husband of the senator, uh, who was, had um, all sorts of surgical approaches to Parkinsonism. Uh, these sort of got forgotten with L-DOPA, but some of them are coming back now, and... Um, I think we, there are many more instruments, but the real breakthrough for the next generation, I think, will be diagnosing and preventing the illness ever becoming clinical. From your mouth to God's ear. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much right. for being here tonight. Thank you all.